So that's cool. So now that you've introduced yourselves, I'd like to introduce myself. So as I mentioned, Cribben, food scientist. About eight years ago, I struggled really badly with with anxiety and depression, and it was it was seemingly on, on the surface my life seemed quite nice. You know, I was I had a nice family. I had a beautiful wife three beautiful children, but inside something was not right with me and I was consciously anxious. There was no way in how I would be standing in front of a group of people talking, let alone even making eye contact. So it was very de debilitating and eventually my marriage collapsed. And so I find myself alone in, in the city. I actually lived with, with James. James was my roommate. but in a room on the verge of, of suicide. And so I'm still standing here, so I didn't actually go down that path. But at being a food scientist, I started to look at ways that I could potentially treat my illness, and that's when I stumbled upon gut health. So the, the psychologists, so I was referred to a psychologist through work, and they would say, well, you need to go on some sort of Prozac or Zoloft or some sort of antidepressant medication. But I didn't really want to go down that path. So the research that I did actually led me to the GAPS, the GAPS book. Has anybody heard of the GAPS book? There's a couple there. Any here on this side? So the GAPS book is just here. So that's the yellow one on the right-hand side. So Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride did a lot of research on her autistic child and autism and, and using essentially diet as a way to treat the dysfunction of the brain. And so I thought, well, if, if autistic children can be turned around via diet, there must be something to it. And that's when I first, she first mentioned kefir. And I had no idea what kefir was. So typically what you do is you go and jump on Google, what is kefir? And that led me down that sort of kefir so I was coming up. Rabbit hole. Get another chair. We'll need one more. Is there one there? Ah, oh, you got your friend here. Beautiful. That's all good. So oh, welcome. So sorry, that that's sorry. okay. You, you've off. you've come just in time. We just kicked it off. I'm just telling the group about my story and why I just, why gut health is so important for me. So Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride led me to kefir, led me to the microbiome. And the microbiome is like the joy of my life. I love the microbiome. Does anybody know what the microbiome is? So this is this is really exciting for me because you're all like totally newbies and you're going to be mind blown when you learn about this stuff. So I'm really excited. So we'll kick off with the microbiome. So let me let me put out a disclaimer to, before I start. I'm not a doctor. We have an amazing medical system. There is lots of good doctors, functional medicine, functional medicine doctors. So if you are struggling with any health elements, I'm happy to refer you on to a functional doctor. I am a food scientist. My approach and my understanding of this subject matter is from 20 years of experience in the food industry and having a very innate understanding of being across more than 100 food manufacturing sites across the world. So one thing I really understand well is how our food is made and how it impacts our body. And now with the microbiome, how it's very early days in terms of the research, but I'm at the forefront of how the diet that we have affects the microbiome. So let me start with the microbiome. What is the microbiome? The microbiome is approximately 100 trillion microbial cells and viruses and yeasts and their genetic material that is present in our body. Most of it is actually in the colon. So again, let me reiterate, I'm a scientist. I will speak a lot of scientific speak and jargon. Please stop me if you don't understand because I want to make sure you fully get this information and get the value from it. So this is all, and it's, it's amazing, microbiome's amazing. We always thought that bacteria were bad, but it turns out that most bacteria are actually beneficial for a body 
and a very important part. And what we're finding is that through our body, there's approximately about seven tennis courts of surface area in the body. And that's pretty much this where our microbiome lives and our skin and other parts of our body. Now, what is this microbiome responsible for? And there's various things that it's actually responsible for. Firstly, scientists now understand that the microbiome is actually an organ. It weighs around two to three kilos and has many, many different functions in the body, which I'll touch on in a sec. So firstly, it's responsible for our immune system. So 80% of our immune system is actually directly related to the microbiome. It's very important for unlocking nutrients via a process of digestion. So 60% of the energy extracted from your food is done by the microbiome and in the gut. Production of vitamins and minerals and enzymes. And for me personally, what was really interesting is the production of neurotransmitters, dopamine, GABA, acetylcholine, and serotonin. Serotonin is how a lot of these, these pharmaceutical drugs work by keeping serotonin longer in the body. Now, is that clear? Have I confused anybody? Or does anybody need further clarification? Are we all good? I've got one question. You mm -hmm. said 80% um, of it is in the colon. Is that what you said? 80% of the immune system is in the gut. But to your point, out of the 100 trillion bacteria in our body and viruses and yeast, about 80 trillion is in the actual colon. So the very last part of your digestive system is where most of these, these bugs live. And the appendix that we originally thought was like a useless organ that we can just discard willy-nilly is that why it's called the appendix? Yeah, it's like at the end of the book, right? Yeah. But it turns out that the appendix is actually a storage mechanism for the bacteria in our body. It's like a backup, like a repository that the body uses to store bacteria that they think is useful for us. Now, what's really unfortunate is that we have, in, in, I guess in the Western world, gone on this massive sort of eradication of bacteria. So what we're finding is now a lot of species of, of gut bacteria and viruses and yeast are starting to become extinct. So it's almost think of the gut as like a rainforest. Does that make sense? Cool. So what's the, like, so you've got all these bacteria in there. There's different types. So what happens is typically when something goes out of balance, we call it dysbiosis. Has anybody heard of dysbiosis? And dysbiosis is when you've got an imbalance of the type of bacteria in the gut. There's no bacteria that you would say categorically is bad. All of them have a, f a function in the body. And this is the research that I'm doing through allele microbiome. But what we're finding is that if some types of bacteria start to dominate versus others, that's when the body can start to go into a diseased state. So I'll start, like, what's the benefits of having these type of different species of bacteria in balance. Well, firstly, you're highly resistant to infection because the microbiome is your defense system. It trains your immune system, so it recognizes what's friend or flow. That's why you know, African kids rolling around in the dirt, exposed to a lot of different types of bacteria, don't have the same problems with allergies and things like that as we do in the West. Nourishment. So the body is nourished. We live in Western world. But we are at a point where, you know, firstly, we're becoming very overweight, but then we're not extracting enough nutrients from our food. And this is because the microbiome is not balanced. When the microbiome is balanced, you will be a lot leaner. Because fat is a storage mechanism for toxicity. So when the body becomes really toxic, and tox toxicity can be environmental factors, even can be the b certain types of bacteria themselves that lead to toxicity. That's when we become overweight. But when everything is balanced, then it's pretty much the body doesn't need to carry as much fat because it doesn't need to store toxins. And other parts of the body that typically store toxins are your organs. So a lot of thyroid dysfunction is due to 
toxins accumulating in the actual thyroid. So that's all part of it as well. You will feel energy and vibrancy, a feeling of well-being. And because the skin is often reflected of what's happening in the gut, your skin health will be a lot better as well. Does that all make sense? Cool. Now let's talk about, we're going to go a, a little bit into the science here. So I'm going to make sure you understand why gut health is important and then how that links to things like fermented foods. So sickness and infection. So when the microbiome is imbalanced, it leads to siction, sick, sickness and infection, cancers. The reason why that is, is because when the immune system is compromised, by having the wrong type of bacteria, that leads you to be more open to infections. The other point is there's a, there's a molecule called LPS, which is actually produced by having the wrong types of bacteria. It's actually the bacteria themselves, but the dead cells have this compound. And this compound, especially when you have something like leaky gut, can actually make its way into the brain, which leads to things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's. It's very early days in terms of the science, but LPS is a significant problem by having the wrong type of gut bacteria. Malnourished, we're not extracting enough nutrients. If we have the wrong types of gut bacteria, think of gut bacteria as like little factories in your body, and they're taking the food that you give it, assuming you're giving it good food, and converting it into nutrients for the body. So obviously, when you have the wrong type of bacteria, you're not getting enough nutrients. And that's why we have to take supplement pills and things like that to top up on nutrients. Does that make sense? Obesity and weight gain. So again, imbalanced microbiome, higher levels of lipopolysaccharide or LPS, triggers the body to store more fat, can also cause problems with estrogen levels, which makes you hold more body weight and fat. Lack of energy. This, this is a amazing research that I just came across. What scientists are starting to discover is that, does anybody know what mar something funny here? I said microbiome is what's wrong with it, that's why I'm late. Ah, okay. <laughs> so let me explain the whole energy equation for one of a better word. So does anybody want know what mitochondria are? So mitochondria are like little energy factories in each cell. So think about it like, like a battery in the cell. But it turns out that scientists have discovered that the mitochondria is actually a bacteria embedded into the cell. And these mitochondria, because they're the energy source of the body, if that energy source is not functioning properly, the cell itself is not functioning properly. So you're not producing enough energy through ATP. Does people know what ATP is? So it's your energy production in your body. And this, this blew my mind. The mitochondria within the cell can actually communicate to your gut bacteria by bypassing the brain. So these guys are having a little party, a conversation with each other without you even being aware. Is that mind blowing? These guys are talking and you've got nothing to do with it. It's just staggering when you think about it. And the final point in terms of the energy equation is that the food that we eat, assuming you're having the right type of foods and enough fiber, produces butyrate. Has anybody heard of the short chain fatty acid butyrate? So typically when you're having lots of fiber, we need lots of fiber to feed our gut bacteria. It's the food for the gut bacteria. So it converts the fiber to butyrate and around 10 to 15 percent of your energy is going to come from butyrate alone. So if you're not having enough fiber, and typically people will recommend you know, 25 to 30 grams of fiber, preferably mixed types of fiber, so lots of types of fruits and vegetables and, and legumes, so everybody's a little bit different. So you know, some people might be on a FODMAP diet or something like that, so you've got to be mindful of that as well. Is anybody on any restrictive diets at the moment? FODMAP, paleo, veganism, vegan. FODMAPs. So what happens with FODMAPs is that when you have some form of gut dysfunction, like a typical one is leaky gut. Now all leaky gut is, is people familiar with leaky gut? It just means that the cells in the gut 
normally they're quite tight together, they start forming some gaps through, through poor diet. Normally it's some form of dietary issue. So that gap gets bigger, and what happens is proteins, which are allergens or all proteins, so that's just to make sure you get that clear. So any form of allergenic protein like lutein will actually make its way through that lining, get into the body, and trigger an auto inflammatory response. So it's the body attacking itself. Now, the, typically what the, the intervention is, is to go into something like FODMAPs, which is great, or something like GAPS, because by doing that, we can work out what's actually causing the issue. Because with FODMAPs, you've got your fructose and all these other things that are causing bloating and gas, but when you take it out, then you can actually alleviate a lot of their symptoms. But ideally, long term, once those issues are addressed, you want to get off that FODMAP situation. So it should be any, any form of restrictive diet should only be enough to heal the gut lining. And we have lots of things that we can help you heal your gut. But it should be only temporary, and then you should get back into having more fiber in your diet to make sure you have this diversity in gut bacteria. So depression, I touched on. The gut bacteria in combination with the gut epithelial cells, so the cells in the gut will produce GABA, serotonin, acetylcholine, neurotransmitters that make you feel good and vibrant. And poor skin. It's an obvious one, dysfunction, inflammation in the body, psoriasis. One, one of the guys is not here that, that's part of Nourishment Organics. He has psoriasis. And he, he went on to, onto the water kefir, and his psoriasis has pretty much disappeared. So it's amazing. Here, Greg, mum. And inflammation. So when you have the wrong type of gut bacteria and you're producing this lipopolysaccharide, the body is in a constant state of very low levels of inflammation. So when the body's inflamed, you're not going to be feeling good because it's, it's yucky. It's, it doesn't lead to you to, to actually being vibrant and healthy. And allergies, I touched on leaky gut. Anybody suffering with any particular gut ailment at the moment? I think I've got a bit of bloating. Bloating, yep. Yeah, it's Everything, <laughs> <laughs> all issues. <laughs> All of the above. Okay, but hopefully some of the, the strategies that we'll give you today will help you to address some of these things. Sorry, say that again, please. Quickly on the protein allergen relationship. Yep, yep. So allergens, so you've got a difference. You've got food sensitivities, which are you know, chili or garlic, onions, something that causes some, some sort of sensitivity. But a true allergen is a protein. So whether it's peanuts or if it's you know, some sort of crustacea or gluten is another common one, those are true allergens because it actually gets into the gut if your gut is leaky and then triggers this allergenic response in the body. And it's essentially the body attacking itself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the issue. I just, um, did that in uh, upgrading my food handlers. They touched on allergens and um, yeah, something that cause, you could die from. It sounds food intolerances are a totally different thing. It's different, but, but people tend yeah. to confuse it. Yeah. But that's just an explanation. But ideally what you want to do is you want to make sure those junctures in the gut are tight. So then the, al the allergen's not going to get into the blood. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that gets into the blood with, with the gap is LPS, lip lipopolysaccharide, mm -hmm. which is hugely damaging to the body. So how do we acquire your microbiome? I'm just going to fly past this because we're moving on pretty fast. So your microbiome is pretty much from your mum. So it's through the birthing process that you get this huge... Is that, is that your mum? <laughs> you <get, laughs> so you get this huge dose of, of good bacteria from your mother as you're being born. And the other thing to, to underscore is that if the mum is in dysfunction, it passes on to the baby. So it's like an hereditary thing. But we've only, we're only really with the industrialization of food, it's, it's probably only two generations. So there's only two generations that we're seeing this dysfunction. But it's a real issue because as we proceed forward with our children, inheriting dysfunction 
the problem gets worse and worse and worse. And that's really heartbreaking for me. And that's why I'm such an advocate to speak, especially to our mums, because our mums are so important, because firstly, they inoculate our children, and they also give us our mitochondria that also comes from your mum. So women are so important to our survival and thriving. The other places you get it, so as you, you get a bit, I guess firstly, as you breastfeed your baby, the human, there's a compound called human milk oligosaccharide. Are you okay? I'm confusing you. Or you good? So human milk oligosaccharide, which means it's not for you. It's not for the baby. Does anybody want to guess what it's for? The baby's gut bacteria. So through, through the way that we've, we're interacting with these bacteria over many, potentially millions of years, the system is in place. And as the baby gets to around three, it starts to interact with the soil, play in the garden, play with the pets, and then it's getting a further inoculation of, of your microbiome bacteria. And then as we get older, our food. So our food is absolutely imperative to having the right type of gut bacteria. Now I want to underscore something else. So through our food supply, and I understand food very intimately, there's a group of, I guess, chemical compounds called xenobiotics. The worst one being antibiotics. Because taking a pill of antibiotics, a course of antibiotics for a week, has been shown to wipe out one third of your gut bacteria. And some of these bacteria you will never get back. So I'm not saying that antibiotics are a bad thing. I'm saying if it's you need it for your health, take the antibiotic. But my issue with antibiotics is it's not the pill that you get from the doctor. It's actually in our meat. So what the industry does is they put antibiotics into the meat to boost the muscle content. It's a commercial reason why they use it. But that antibiotic stays in the food supply and then continues to damage your gut bacteria as you consume it. So even when you cook it, it's still active. Food additives, plastics, fluoride, pesticides, even things like being overly stressed. As Aussies, we work really hard. We're hardworking people. But stress is very damaging to the gut bacteria. So be very mindful of breathing, stress management type activities as well. <coughs> and this takes me to things that can, we can use to correct dysfunction, dysbiosis. If for instance, and most of us have been down this path where before we were privy to this information, maybe our diet wasn't right, maybe we were a bit stressed, but the good news is that we can correct this, these problems through things like probiotics. Does anybody want to guess what a probiotic is? up there good essentially good bacteria pro meaning good but biotic life anti against biotic life for life against life so probiotics <coughs> are a group of bacteria that have some sort of benefit to our body they're not necessarily colonizing but by having it, so colonizing means that they actually go down to the gut, attach to the lining, and live there. And I did this to myself. I threw a fecal sample because our other company, Allele Microbiome, we can test fecal samples. So I was really interested because I've been having kefir for a long time and I wondered, well, are they actually surviving in my gut? Because I know they're doing good. I know it's good for me. But is it actually surviving in the gut? And the answer is yes. I tested myself and I found around 60 to 80 billion kefir bacteria in my gut. So it can colonize, but the World Health Organization just defines it as anything that has some sort of benefit. So that's the one we lean on. And then there's another group called prebiotics. Does anybody <laughs> want to guess what prebiotics are? It's fiber, which is good for the bacteria. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the food for the good bacteria. So if you think of the gut as like a garden, the prebiotics are like the fertilizer that helps the good guys grow, essentially. The ones that you want lots of in the gut are things like lactobacilli, 
Bifidobacteria, Achaemensia, Rosburia. You can Google it yourself later. <laughs> There's all these good bacteria. We can test you at a little microbiome and tell you exactly what's in your gut and how to boost the good guys up as well. <coughs> and pre, so I get you to pass some of these around. And so here, some of these are pre and some of these are actually used. Some things like collagen and colostrum powders are used to seal the gut. Yep, so collagen, colostrum, pr primarily proteins that help seal that juncture between the gut epithelial cells. And other things, one I really love because it's FODMAP friendly is acacia fiber. Now what acacia fiber does is it helps to boost your, what we call peacekeeping bacteria, things that keep everything in balance, called bifidobacteria, which you'll notice a lot in your yogurts and lactobacilli. And kefir is full of lactobacilli, absolutely teeming with it. But this is, this is the strategy that we recommend is using a probiotic and using a prebiotic together to actually put in the good bacteria and then give it the actual food to thrive in the gut. Does that make sense? So there's two ways you can get probiotics. Firstly, you can take probiotic tablets or yogurts and things like that. There's some really good probiotic supplements. We've just got a, a one recently called VSL number three. Has anybody heard of VSL number three? No one? It is the most researched probiotic on the planet. So it's the one that's used in all the clinical trials when they're saying, oh, probiotics are good, it does X, Y, Z. It's VSL number three. So that's on our website if you're interested in that. Far cheaper and economically for <laughs> everyday use and far more fun is actually making fermented foods. Is anybody familiar with fermented foods? Who's making kefir, firstly? Any kefir makers? None. <laughs> One, kind of, two. Kombuchas, a couple of kombuchas, fermented vegetables, a couple of fermenters, nice, I'm liking it. Okay, so we call it the Holy Trinity. Kefir, kombucha, fermented vegetables. Very, very fun and economical. So much fun. And super cheap, very cheap. Probiotic pills will cost you, so the VSL number three that we have, a course of VL3 for one, VL cell number three for one month is $120 per month. Not everybody wants to make fermented food, so we have that option. But I'm sure you guys are here to make fermented foods because it's fun and easy. So let's start with kefir. So this we've got milk kefir. And we have water kefir. Okay. So that's a kefir grain. A kefir grain. So what, what a kefir grain is is it's, it's what we call a polysaccharide. So it's groups of sugars stuck together. But the bacteria themselves are like, think of them like a gang. They're like a group of bacteria a long, long time ago, probably many hundreds, of, maybe thousands of years ago, formed a gang together. So kefir has approximately anywhere between 50 and 100 strains. And they all live together. But they live together and they make their own house. So the grain is the bacteria interacting together to produce this little gel. And the law behind milk kefir, there's mentions of it very early in the Bible, in the Old Testament. For my research, I believe, this is what my belief is, is it actually came from the Asiatic tribes, primarily the Mongols, who were nomadic, and they were storing milk, or primarily horse milk, in, in some sort of casing and inside of this, this these bacteria start to group together because they were making things like alcohol with with this product so then through the mongol conquest it moved itself to areas like russia and it finally found itself into in 16th century france it was a, it was a jewish doctor that actually the, the king was very sick this, this is the law he was very sick he brought a hundred sheep, he brought milk kefir, 
he, the king got better and the king called it the milk of eternal life. Sounds a bit woo-woo, but then in 1907, a guy by the name of Eli Mechnikov, Nobel Prize winner, started to look at groups of Bulgarian centurions. And what he discovered was that the Bulgarians, who were living constantly over, very often over 100, were consuming a lot of these type of dairy fermented type products, very rich in lactobacilli. So what's the benefits of having kefir? Let me take one step back. So water kefir, again, I'm not 100% sure on what the actual origin is. For my research, I think it's either going to be China or Mexico. And the way these things have developed, they're also a biofilm, but I believe they've developed in very rich mineral springs. And our ancestors in the past, they've probably noticed these crystals in the water and started to collect them and use them in a culinary way and starting to make fermented type drinks. So what's the bit? So there's a question? Yeah, I just take a question. Yep. For the grains, can you reuse them like a scoby? Do they yes. grow? Yes, they grow. So, okay. They grow like, our water kefir grains should be doubling, tripling every week. Oh. I mean, this thing is just, you look after them yeah. and they just multiply like rabbits. Oh. And it's the same thing with, with the milk kefir. It doesn't grow as fast, mind you, but it still replicates. So once you get a whole of grains, you have this for life. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can share with your family members. and It's, it's really, they call, the ancients called it a gift from the gods, and I really believe it's a gift for us. Are you going to be talking about the benefits of the difference? Between yes. Yeah. So milk kefir has far more strains. So it's probably around 50 to 100 strains. Michael Mosley in his book, anybody heard of Michael Mosley? Mm -hmm. he, he says around 50, but I've seen some studies that have 100. So it depends on what source you get it from. So they say we say conservatively 50. 50 is a lot of strains, that's a lot. And we've had ours tested, so you can go on the website and see all our particular strains, or species, I should say. Water kefir has around 15 strains. So it's less, but th the thing is, what we want to have a healthy gut is we want diversity. It's not just you know, a handful of, or you know, three from a, from a yogurt, three strains from a, a yogurt you buy from the supermarket. What science is telling us is diversity is the most important thing, to have lots of gut diversity. And we can test that for you as well. We can give you a, a gut diversity score and tell you, well, you're seven out of 10 or you're two out of 10, geez, have some more. I've seen two out of 10s before. I've seen, the highest I've seen is around seven out of 10. I'm around five, I'll be honest, I'm not that great. I'm getting better. So what you want is diversity, and the people that I see have the most diversity, I've seen a guy who was a forester, who was spending lots of time in the gardens and things like that, he had a very high diversity score. The worst I've seen is around one, and that was from a lady who'd just gone through like, like huge health issues, chemo, antibiotics. She had pretty much nothing left. It was just one group that's left. So what we want is diversity. So you want a bit of milk kefir. You want a bit of fermented vegetables. You want you know, water kefir, because they're all different. They all have different functions in the body. So diversity. Can you make kefir out of plant-based milk? You can, absolutely. I'll touch on that in a sec. So what's the benefits? So it's rich in probiotics, it boosts your immune system. It's, it ha does lend itself to also a lot of people that use milk kefir will use it for anti-cancer reasons. Antidepressant, it's detoxifying to the body, it can kill candida. Lactobacilli produce peroxide which can spray candida. So if you have some, does everybody know what candida is? It's this yeast infection, candida. So candida albicans, so it can actually kill candida. So it's a good way to treat gut, gut, uh, gut dysfunction. It's detoxifying. The gut is known as, a, almost these days, known as a second liver. Because if you can pre-digest things and detoxify your food and what's happening in the gut before it has to go to the liver, it takes a lot of pressure off the liver. So it's called the second liver. 
You can use it for treatment of IBS, bloating, gut issues, treatment of allergies, and even asthma. Does that make sense? How much? How much do we? Yep, great question. So what I recommend get the to benefit, so the, the best thing is to start slow. Because what happens is if you have, for instance, a leaky gut, so what happens is the actual, like you, the cells can actually go through the gut. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pointing this way. <laughs> it's, it's this way. So the cells can actually go, go through that, that gut lining and create what we call a Herxheimer reaction, where it's, and it's like, a, like an inflammatory response. So what you want to do with any sort of probiotic food is to go slowly, so I'd start maybe with a teaspoon a day. Oh. It's potent. I'm talking billions of bacteria. Like it's really potent. I give it to my daughter almost every morning. Good. In fact, she even has like a good one. Great. Milk. Sorry, we're laughing for it. Oh, okay. So, yeah. A similar probiotic type product yeah. with lots of bacteria. No, I got it from this Russian deli. Ah, okay. Are those would be the same? It's not, this is a good point. So firstly, start slow, mm -hmm. very slow. Introduce it. Watch how your body reacts to it. And then up your dose. Work your way up to in a cup a day. A cup a day is plenty. Mix it in smoothies. You can cook with it. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Now to your point, the store-bought stuff, I only know of one brand that's real kefir. Mm -hmm. That's the fermentary. The fermentary, I know Sharon, she uses kefir grains to make her product. Everything else that I know of, touch wood, is fake. So they're using artificial starter cultures. It's essentially yogurt called kefir. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have the same level of bacterial diversity. It's only a handful of strains, not the full quota. And obviously when you buy it, it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. The fermentary will be like health food stores, but ideally, I hope you're here, is to learn how to make it yourself. Because ah, yeah. it's so super, good. super easy. And I'm just going to demonstrate now how easy it is. <laughs> so we'll start with the milk. So there's a couple of things you'll need. So milk if your greens, we have these downstairs. So feel free to grab some. And what's optional is what we have is a milk kefir growth premix. And what this is, is the actual couple of things. There's whey protein, there's colostrum, and there's inulin. Whey protein helps boost grain growth, because some people want lots of grains. So it boosts the growth of the grains. The inulin is a prebiotic fiber. So what it does is it boosts the lactobacillus content of the product. So it's giving you more lactobacillus. And colostrum, is actually going through clinical trials right now to actually be used to treat leaky gut. So it seals those junctures in the gut. It's a very, very nutritious product. So how do we make it? So we have this beautiful kefir maker from Slovenia, European made. You don't need the fancy gadgets, by the way. This is, making kefir is very tedious. So when I first started it, you, know, you have a strainer, you have a glass, little mason jars and things like that. This just takes the hassle out of it because you're doing this every day. I mean, once you get this, it's like pets. You leave it, they'll die. So you've got to keep them fed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like they're live, they're live organisms. <laughs> and you, you treat them well, they'll treat you well back. So, <laughs> so, so what we do is we just whack these in. So kefir grains in. Just you, all you're trying to do is trying to make it easy as, easiest as possible because if it's easy, then you'll keep having it. Once it gets difficult, it's hard to form a good habit. So we try and simplify the process. So all the grains are in. This is 250 mils of milk. We use biodynamic. You can use A2. A2 is a good option. Nice, soft, easy to digest protein that doesn't cause the same issues as A1 milk protein. Goat's milk is A2. So either of those options are good. 
Lactose intolerant, I will show you another option with you as well in a second. So lactose, so lactose intolerant people will, will do generally well on having kefir. The reason why is because the lactose is pre-digested. So when you lack the lactase enzyme, the milk kefir does the work for you. The grains will digest lactose. So you should be fine. You can also use nut milks, which I'll show you in a sec. But I do. It, it won't work. It won't work because the, the the actual bacteria need lactose to feed off, to grow, to thrive. It's like their food source. So we get a tablespoon of this premix in. Give it a mix, and voila, it's done. It's easy as that. Is the premix something you have to constantly feed it? It's optional. No, optional, but if you want to use it. If you want to use it, you can use it sporadically if you choose to. You can use it if you're noticing, oh, my grains are sluggish. I use it all the time because I want the additional health benefits of the inulin, the FOS inulin. And I want fast growing grains. So that's important for us. So, lids on. So you'll see this is a quite, it, it looks like a glass jar. It looks simple, but there's a lot of thought that's gone into this by the Slovenian guys at Kefir Co. So you've got two strainers. You've got a small one and a large one. One for milk and one for water. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. you got so two strainer, one for milk, one for water. This lid, what I recommend, can you see it, sorry? Mm -hmm. So, and this part here, that little thing, is tells you the ratio of grains to add. So you just fill it up to that and put it in. So if you know if it's, the grains are growing too much, you know when it's time to increase your bat size, take some grains out, eat it, put it in smoothies, and definitely be consumed. Lots of good health benefits from eating kefir grains as well. So what you do is you just put this on, just slightly open. You can keep it closed. There's a reason why I recommend you keep it slightly open. By putting air into the ferment, you're limiting the production of alcohol. So if you're gonna give it to children, you're sensitive to alcohol, this is the general go-to. If you want a slightly higher probiotic content, keep it sealed. Because what that will do is it will suppress yeast and favor lactobacilli. So you get a slightly higher probiotic content, but more alcohol. And I'm talking very, very minuscule amounts of alcohol, like well under 0.5. So nothing to worry about. For milk kefir. Water kefir is a different story. Mm -hmm. If you do have leaky gut, doesn't alcohol um, interrupt those tight junctions in your gut? I'm talking really minuscule levels of alcohol. Like it's so, like I mean, if you have, it, it, most fermented things will have a trace amount of alcohol. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is a problem, yeah. but I'm talking when you're drinking copious amounts. Yeah. Like, but in this situation, it's negligible. Yeah. Any questions here? We're good? So you do have the option of making nut milks. So what I recommend is a good quality nut milk brand. And look at the label and make sure that it's got no nasty chemicals in there. So I'll pass it around and have a look at the label and you'll see that it's pure. It's just coconut, that's all it is. The lining of the can is BPA free. So remember I talked about xenobiotics, BPA is a very, very damaging xenobiotic. Really messes with your hormones. So you want definitely BPA out of the diet, out of your food. So you can use that, you can use nut milks, you can use almond milk, you can use cashew milk. milk, you can use rice milk. The only thing is they'll get to a point where the grains might start to deteriorate because they're not getting lactose. So what grains would you use, the water, the water ones or the? Milk, Milky. milk for this. But they still have animal protein in milk or no, so when we produce, we would produce a special one mm -hmm. just for vegans and vegetarians okay. where we take out milk. Right. But this is if you just want to use regular milk grains, like probably not yourself, but someone else who is making a batch of normal milk kefir, then they want to try coconut milk kefir, 
you can use it interchangeably. Okay. But we have a special one for you. Okay. Thank you. But they won't, the disclaimer is they won't grow when you don't use normal milk. So it's up to you. I use rice milk for my latte, but my son's a barista and he says, don't ask for a latte because it doesn't froth. <laughs> There's enough Doesn't protein. Matter, tasty. Yeah. For the research. Mm -hmm. So everybody's comfortable with milk kefir? So how long does it? Oh, sorry, I didn't say that. Yeah, if you can drink it. Yes, so you're talking roughly around. <laughs> There's something, Mum? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure if you drink any of the milk. Or yeah, I heard it. Yeah. <laughs> Have we got samples? You want to yeah, get, get some samples around. So about 24 hours is what we recommend. It really depends on the temperature. So what I recommend is you, you taste. So after 24 hours, have a taste and see the tartness. And you stop the ferment when you're ready to stop the ferment. The longer you leave it, it turns into cheese. <laughs> yep. Yes. So when you over ferment, say you're going to about 48 hours, you'll see that the whey and the curds will separate. This is a cheese maker so from Kefika. So I drink, so my father makes it, the kefir, and then the cheese is left over. So yes. But he does the milk, ah. what I can tolerate. Right. So, um, but that's what happens. So you drink the whey? No. No, you drink the, no, the kefir. Oh, you drink the kefir? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It aside, so it's like liquid. I don't know. I don't know how to make it, but yeah. yeah. I will now. You will now. <laughs> that, that's the kefir is the one that's going around. So you, you, you'll be perfectly fine to have that. Yeah. Because it's really strong. There's very minimal lactase left. Sour. It'll be sour. So. <laughs> so yeah. So so you judge for yourself. It's an artisanal craft. It's it's using bacteria. It's not using a starter culture. You're purely using something that's from nature that's susceptible to temperature variations, weather, seasons, the flavors you'll produce will be different in summer versus winter. So play with it and that's the best way to understand the product. Now what you can do as well, I'll get someone to help me with this. Any volunteers that want to help? Yep, thanks. Man. So what you can do is you can take the kefir and we've got this, it's just about to arrive in the country, I don't have any yet, but they're coming. But you can see what it does is it actually presses, presses the kefir down through a strainer. So you have the whey in the bottom, which you can make kvass with. You're familiar with kvass? Kvass, or you can you know, make, so you can even use it for fermenting vegetables. You can use that part. I love to drink this. It's so rich with protein and it's full of probiotics. So I've left this in the fridge for a couple of days. So what I'll get you to do so I'll hold that. So you pull it out. Or we'll do it so people can see it. Yep. So I'll get you to face the audience. Hold it over there. We'll, not we'll, we'll do it in this corner. So then we got. Can you guys see this? Anybody getting a view? Might have been distracted. You've probably already said it. Yes. What you've got in the top is that the the kefir that you've drained off, or did that have the grains in it? No grains in this. So this is pure ke kefir that we made. Yes, right. through, a, through a cheese maker. So you pull the spring out. Yep, that's it, perfect. Yep. And you pull that little plastic part out. Yep. Yep, and then that's on the it. Plate? Yep, on the plate. And then you can pull this part out. Yep. You can see. Oh, there yeah. we go. There we go. Mm. So that's kefir cheese. Okay. So. So I'll explain. So what we're doing is we're passing it through a sieve. Yep. So you can use this to make mutt milks as well. Mm. You can use the exact same device. It's just putting through a, sprit, a, a sieve mm -hmm. and putting pressure on it so it pushes all the liquid through and keeps the cheese. So that's all it is. So it's just putting a kefir through the... And you can flavor that up. You so can, that's the cheese maker. So what you can do is you, uh, uh, the, yes, the, the kefir that we made. We just when it's ready after 24 hours, we just pour it in here, put that in the fridge, and it makes it cheese. And it's very versatile. And that that has heaps of recipes and things like that that you can experiment with. What does it taste like? Does it taste like 
What I'll do, I'll tell you what, I'll get my team to get you some samples and you can try it. We won't put any flavorings in it, but you can use that as a dessert option. You can use that as, you know, just using cream cheese, put it on toast, cream jam, all sorts of, and it's full of probiotics, loaded with probiotics. So let's move on to. So, what do you, can I ask one, one thing? Um, yeah. So, the booster that you gave it, yep. has that got any animal products? Like this will have. This will have whey protein and it will have colostrum. colostrum. They're both animal products, so not suitable for either of you. Yep. So, while that cheese is getting prepared, I'll show you how to make water kefir. How is the flavor of the water in the milk for you guys? It's like Enjoyable? Water, enjoyable. <laughs> it's a bit sour. Yeah, Anybody really find it a bit not. tangy? Yeah. The, the, the thing with kefir is you can take the ferment where you want to take it. So if you want it less sour, just ferment it less. And it'll be more sweet than bready. Just short. We ferment long because we ferment long for food safety, keep the pH low. But for the home person, you can ferment it less for flavor. Okay. Water kefir. You notice on the kefir maker, it's got two lines, one for milk, one for water. <coughs> Very smart guys. So water makes more. Mm -hmm. you need mm. more, liquid. more, more. It's, it's 500 mils. So milk, I put 250 mils of milk. Water, I put, I'm going to put 500 mils. Should you have to start with? Did you say teaspoon? A teaspoon. And then the next day? Work your way, maybe for the first week, like t teaspoon, see how you feel. Am I feeling brain fog? Am I getting loose bowels? Am I breaking out in a rash? These are all signs of first time reactions. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is once that, if, if you're experiencing it, obviously dial back a bit. Once it passes, or if you're not experiencing it, amp up to a cup a day. But the first week go slow, then the second week 250 mils. And how do you store that kefir before you make your next batch? Yep, you can store it in the fridge, which is perfectly fine. That'll keep for a good two to four weeks. It's very sour, so it's not in water or anything. Just the grains or the grains. the grains in milk. So ideally, what you want to do is always be fermenting, always fermenting. And if you batch that in for 24 hours, yes. and you're at 250 mils, yes. and you're only having a teaspoon a day, yes. so you're obviously going to be throwing some out until you get until you that, the whole batch a day. That's a good point. You'll, you'll hit like a critical mass where you can have it every day. Yeah. If you do need to store the grains, just put it in the fridge and some milk mm. in the fridge, and it will just slow it down. Yeah. It will just pretty much like hibernate in the fridge. But it's, it's got lactose as a food source, so it's not going to die. Yeah, it's just like kombucha. But if you want to get like, if you have a skipper batch, you just let it sit for like about three weeks and then you just. It's like still living. Yes. The kombucha is all touch on it yeah. later. But yeah, you're making a hotel, yeah. essentially. Mm -hmm. Kombuchas you don't store in the fridge, though. That's the only difference. Yeah. Yep. Right. So this is the grains in. Water is in. We've got our prunes. So this, I'm very, very proud of this product. It took me six months on the laboratory bench, pulling my hair out, literally, to get this formulation right. Because water kefir, people who know it well, will know it's called the princess of ferments, because it's very, very tricky. So what we've done, <laughs> it is a tricky character. So what we've done is we've created this, and it's very mineral sensitive. So you know the mineral content of your water is slightly off. What type of water are we using? Then some people will say put fruits, put molasses, put bicarb. What type of bicarb are you using? So what we do is we create this formula that's pretty much what we use downstairs when we make the product. But it's very, very consistent. And it produces a good flavor. Uh, filtered water or um, just tap water? That's a good point. I'll touch on that in a second. So just a tablespoon of sugar. 
And remember is that all the sugar, or most of it, will be fermented out. So we use Rapidura. We use Rapidura. So the premix has, has, has Rapidura, bicarb, but it's not bicarb you get off the supermarket shelf. It's a more a higher grade of bicarb that I've actually tested because bicarb actually stabilizes the, the acidity of the product, which is very important for the growth of the grains. A little bit of Himalayan salt and molasses. But the key to this is the ratio. Oh, we've got the cheese here. You guys want to try the cheese? And so what you want to do is the same process, lid slightly open. This is going to be around 48 hours, so it's slightly longer. Now you point to, to water. Water is extremely, extremely important, the quality of water that you use. So you can use, you can use something like a filtered water, but you have to adjust the mineral content. So what I recommend if you're just starting out, I think most of you guys are just starting out. The easiest way to get this product right is to just use tap water. But what we want to do is get the chlorine out because chlorine is very damaging to the gut microbiome. It's an antibiotic. Chlorine is an antibiotic. Very, very important, but it's easy to get rid of. All you have to do is boil the water, let it cool down, and you can use it. And it takes the chlorine out. Alternatively, what you can do is you can just pour it into like a pot leave it somewhere, just put a cloth on top of it and leave it overnight and the chlorine will flush out of the product. What so this, fluoride? Mm -hmm. the fluoride unfortunately you have to use a filter. Mm. So it depends, if you're sensitive to fluoride. I came from Warburton just a couple I of months love ago, Warburton. there's no fluoride in the water up there and now yes. I'm I can't afford a filter here. Don, Donna <laughs> yeah. we, we love Donna Boeing. If you want to collect spring water, this is an amazing mountain up in Donna Boeing. Is anybody collecting spring water? You tried it? Yeah. It's the best water ever. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> but if fluoride's an issue, you can try using filtered water, but it, it, not, it might not necessarily work. You have to play with it. I think it's fine. Yeah. It's, it's very mineral dense, yep. but I think it should be perfectly fine. Yeah. Rainwater, <laughs> spring water. Yes, yep. Oh, cool. The only watch out is reverse osmosis because you have to reverse osmosis to get rid of fluoride pretty much. Or you can use a Berkey filter. That's the other way to get rid of fluoride. With the water tap, if you leave it open or as well? Good point. So again, keeping it closed will dramatically increase the alcohol content. So you could produce something potentially like a beer with water kefir. I'm talking as high as 5%. So it is very... <laughs> some people might want that. I don't, I don't know. Cheap alcohol. Life is good. But if, if you're sensitive to alcohol, if you're giving it to children, if you're going to be driving or something like that, just leaving the lid open will stymie that alcohol production. First ferment doesn't produce that much alcohol. Second ferment. Now this is where you can get a lot of alcohol. So I'll show you how to second ferment. When you open the bar up. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so what you tasted was pretty much a first ferment, the water kefir that went around. But you can get really, really fancy with second ferments. And so all we've got here is a bit of organic sour cherry juice. And this will produce something like Dr. Pepper, that kind of flavor. Not that I drink soft drinks anymore, I'm just <laughs> recalling back from childhood. <laughs> so all we do is we get some water kefir, which my team is going to get some, and we'll make it for you. But what you're doing is essentially you're taking water kefir and you're blending it with fruits, some form of fruit juice, so you're giving it more sugar. So the first ferment will ferment all the sugar out, then, but we can't put anything else in the first ferment it's going to damage the grains. So we use second ferment <coughs> to make it more, I guess, more sexy. You can put more flavors into it. You can make ginger ale, ginger beer. You can use raspberry. You can use sour cherry, pomegranate. There's endless, endless combinations. And the beauty is that you choose what you want to put. It's your choice. It's your palate. Use orange juice. You can make almost like a Fanta type product. You can put nutraceutical products like 
ginger, you know, things that are going to add more <coughs> health benefits to the product. You can put herbs in it. Endless, endless combinations that you can use. Any questions while I'm waiting for my water kefir? Yeah, just in terms of the process. So obviously day one is the grains and the water lid on. Day two, do you drain off all of the liquid or some of the liquid? Yep. Add more water, what, what happens after day Yep, so what you do is you literally, after day two, you're just gonna pour this out. You're gonna pour it and store it somewhere else. Yep. You're gonna pour it into a, use a glass bottle which I recommend we have lots of those bottles there there's growlers and just store it in the fridge and then you use this as primarily your fermentation vessel because this is going this is the workhorse this is fermenting all the time and once it's ready you're putting it out yep. separate we've got these bottles as well these are great these are awesome for second ferments the reason why is because firstly they don't explode and on that grooves group We've had people that have gone and bought cheap stuff mm. and had explosions. <laughs> I'm talking literally glass. Yeah. He's a creator. <laughs> Done it. <laughs> yeah. So we have gas rated bottles. All these bottles are all gas rated, so they're not going to explode. They're designed to handle pressure. So it's very, very important. And if you don't own or buy that um, mechanism, is it just yes. a mason's jar with cloth over cloth. the top of it? Cloth. Yeah. For both ferments because you, you you don't really want to make it anaerobic unless you want alcohol <laughs> your choice but cloth is perfectly fine and what about plastic no good plastic bottles well no. i'm not a huge fan of fermenting in plastic yeah. the reason why is because you're creating something that's very acidic and something that's acidic in nature is very reactive to plastic Glass is very innate. Yeah. It's not going to react with the product. So that's the difference. So what we're going to do is, is add roughly ten percent. So there's a bit of bucket chemistry about this. So 250 mils, 25 mils of juice. So I'm not adding a lot of juice. The more juice you add, the more alcohol you'll produce. So if you're making it for kids, Keep the juice content low as possible. You know what I like to do? Is I like to just add a complex form of sugar for the bacteria. They tend to like it. They produce more gas and more fizz. So what we have is some dried figs. What we do is just take a couple of these figs. And it creates a nice flavor. Dried figs? Dried figs. So these are sulfite free. So there's no chemicals in it. There's no preservatives. Because remember, preservatives are antibiotics, pretty much. They're going to kill good bacteria. And a lot of dried fruits will have sulfites to stop the, color dis the discoloration. But I don't care about the color. I just want it clean and healthy. Yeah, yeah, sulfites, wines, mm. rich in sulfites too. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this really tight. So I want to trap all that gas in. And then after two days, you just leave this at room temperature. And after two days, you open this, it's going to fizz. Yeah. yeah, and it's going to be fizzy, almost like a soft drink. And the flavor combinations are endless. Any questions before I move on? Good? We're good. So we get... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, um, so do you have to leave it for two days? Like if it's for kids, would you just leave it for a day so it didn't ferment too much? Or does it just have to be two days before it's ready? I think you judge for yourself. I mean, if you ferment shorter, you're going to have more sugar. Mm -hmm. So you're balancing out, I guess, keeping the, the actual alcohol low 
but then you don't want to give your kids too much sugar as well. So you're kind of just finding that happy medium where the flavor is like too sour, the alcohol's low, the sugar, most of the sugar's fermented out, which it should be. So if you're seeing gas and it's sour, you know the, the sugar's fermenting out. Dried cranberries and yeah. dried strawberries and stuff like that. Absolutely. The flavour combinations are literally endless. You choose what you want to put in it. So How old is the one that you've used to make that? So that would have been like probably a 48 hour okay. ferment yeah, yeah. that we do downstairs. Because mm. okay. it's considerably darker, isn't it? Because mm. mm -hmm. mm. we put so much molasses. Okay. We use quite a bit of molasses to keep the grains healthy. Okay, let's keep moving. Kombucha. So you're all good with kefir, comfortable. We know how to make it, we know how to second ferment. We know why it's good. Kombucha. Oh, sorry, I yeah, milk. Kefir milk, yep, yeah. sure, shoot. Great question. You, it's the same situation. You can second ferment with milk kefir. So you can turn it to cheese, you can even add fruits, but do it on the second ferment. Or you could just, just flavor it. Like when I have mine, I have it with, I put banana starch, you know, the green banana starch, I put in a bit of psyllium husk, I put in blueberries, because I'm boosting all the prebiotics and the, the antioxidants as well. But you flavor it how you want. Some people you like even putting orange pieces of oranges or even orange peels, lemon peels. So it's very, very versatile. You flavor it as you want it. So there's two types of kombucha. Are people aware of that? There's two types? Is that interest? Okay. This is cool. There's two types. Two very different beasts. They're cousins, but they're different. So this is regular kombucha, and this is jun kombucha. What was this one called again, sorry? Jun, J-U-N, J-U-N. So kombucha is a fermented tea. As I mentioned, there's two types. There's kombucha, which is made with black tea, and sugar, and jun kombucha, which is its cousin, is made with green tea and honey. Both originate from China. So that scoby that you see on the top, what they call a scoby, is called a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeasts. So what happens is through the fermentation process, much like kefir, the bacteria and the yeast, the little gang, create a biofilm or pericle, and that's what you see on the top. So all that is bits of sugar. The scoby is actually more so in the liquid. So you can make kombucha with just the liquid. The scoby part, the pieces part, is just aesthetic, purely aesthetic. So all the goodness is in the actual liquid to make kombucha. Interesting, I had a friend gave me a scoby and mm. the recipe for kombucha and it was with green tea yes. and raw sugar. Yep. Not Yes, yeah. and so what people do is they can convert a scoby, like a regular scoby, to feed off green tea. Mm -hmm. It's a little, or even herbal teas for mm -hmm. that matter. It's, but it creates some weird scoby sometimes, mm -hmm. and it doesn't guarantee it's gonna work. Right. So it is possible, but it's not foolproof. That's the only difference. Right. So what are the benefits of kombucha? We've got samples, kombucha samples, get them out. So we're doing a jun kombucha tasting today. So this is made of green tea and honey. So I like this product. This is, I favor this product. The reason why I favor it is honey is a prebiotic. Lots and lots of inulin in honey, one of the highest sources. This is raw honey, it's pure, it's organic. So you're getting the benefits of having a prebiotic in there with the honey, but then you're also getting the benefit of having green tea, which is higher in antioxidant content than kombucha. Does that make sense? 
honey for maple syrup? Organic? I recommend Hydrate. not. <laughs> Somehow this beast yeah. likes green tea and honey. Yeah. You can experiment, which is so much fun, mm. but be prepared that it might not work. So it's a little bit of mad, mad science. <laughs> Prepare for tears. Yeah. Yeah. That's the gin, yeah? Yeah, this is the gin. So what are the benefits of kombucha? Kombucha is not really a probiotic. You hear this, guys. It is not really a probiotic. I think it's more a prebiotic from the research that I've done. It's more akin to having something like cider vinegar. Someone was saying they had cider vinegar. Yeah. So it's more, it's more like a cider vinegar. So the acetate, the short chain fatty acid acetate, which is rich in kombucha, is where I believe most of the benefits are actually coming from. There's not a lot of, there's Saccharomyces boiardi, boiardi, sorry, which is a yeast, a probiotic yeast that might be in there, but that's one strain. The commercial stuff, you'll see some brands will use Bacillus coagulans, which is not naturally in kombucha. It's artificially added. The reason why is because it's a spore. So they can pasteurize the product. That's the only reason why they put that in there. So be mindful. Most of the, the, the brands that you see on the shelf, kombucha brands, are not real kombucha. They're fake kombucha. The reason why is because of the alcohol content. When you make kombucha, it produces a lot of alcohol and producers can't sell the product if it's above 0.5%. Mm. If they sell it, they have to sell it with a liquor license. Hence, I don't know of any brand that's real kombucha. But why would you buy it when it's so easy to make at home? It's like really simple and really cheap, cost-effective, economical. And all you need to do is, so we've got tea, we've got a litre of tea. We've got a quarter of a cup of sugar. Sounds like a lot of sugar. Most of it's going to ferment out. This is a long ferment. This is seven to ten days. June could be up to ten days. It's a long ferment. And we've got this kombucha crock. Lead free, handmade. A litre of tea is in. A quarter of a cup of sugar. And we've cooled this down. It's got to be cool. And does anybody have my little friend? Ah, oh, my mum. Yep. So, Crip, why do you yep. use um, tea? Can you just, why not water and sugar? Water and sugar? The tannins, okay. in the tannins are what the bacteria and the yeast use. So it's this very ancient product. Okay. It's potentially thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. But they've, it, again, it's the same concept where Somehow, sporadically, a group of yeast and bacteria got together and they formed this biofilm. And then for culinary reasons, our ancestors would have just keep reusing it. So they produced this product. And most, most fermented products are like that. Does anybody want to guess what fer fermentation actually means? Boiling. boiling. It means boiling because the ancients, when they used to make it, would see bubbles and assume it was boiling. That's the, so you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, how much of the sugar comes out of the fermented stuff? Most of it. Most of it. I don't... I'll have, we can measure it. I mean, we can actually measure it, but we haven't actually measured because there's no real... I, I know if, if, if it's not sweet and it's really sour, it's going to be a very low sugar content. Mm -hmm. As to the actual precise amount, I don't actually know. I can measure it then, let you know. We've got the equipment to measure it. Herbal teas are possible, but only if you have a spare scobies. So when you make this kombucha, you're going to produce a new scoby every batch. So this lends itself to experimentation with alternative types of teas. But if you just get a scoby from us and you whack this straight into herbal tea, it might not work. But it's fun to play with. I recommend actually using a spare because you will produce a lot. You'll have more scobies than you know what to do with. Pet treats, composting. Hmm? 
they, they make their smoothies, you can work in the smoothie. They're making jackets and leather and all sorts of packaging they're making with Scobies now. So we're going to whack this in here. Give it a bit of a shake, just to make sure all those yeast cells are not sinking on the bottom. That's it. <laughs> it's not rocket science. And you just leave this now for about seven days, and what you'll start to find, is anybody, there's a few kombucha makers, isn't there? And you'll see that sort of, that biofilm forming. What I recommend again, after day three, is taste, and get used to what you want. And that, that gives you an indication, well, at this point, it's still too sweet for me. I need to ferment longer. Ooh, it's getting a bit cidery here. I better stop the ferment, bottle it. And it's the same process for second fermentation. Same ratios. Instead, you just use kombucha. You can use the fruits, whatever you like. Seal it. And that's a lot better than the store-bought stuff. So are you drain to, uh, when you've got it to the taste you like, mm -hmm. you take it all out, you drain it all out, and bottle it, yes. and then replace it with what you started with again. So what you do is you reserve some of the liquid, mm -hmm. you keep that aside. Because you're going to need 100 mils per litre ah, to start, start the next again. batch. So you keep 100 mils aside, in the scoby aside, and the rest of it you bottle and you drink, you can store it in the fridge mm -hmm. to drink, yeah. and then you, you just start the batch again. Yeah. But then I'll show you something else, is what you can do is rather than going so every, rather than going every seven days, I'm going to make five litres or whatever batch size you're making, you can create a continuous brew. You familiar with continuous brews? No? Okay. So anybody's familiar with continuous? So this is how we do it. So I'll start right from the beginning. So when you buy a SCOBY from us, you have enough to make one litre. So the first step is to make a litre. So you can make a litre in the crock. So once that litre is ready, you're going to reserve 500 mils. So half the batch. Because that is going to be enough to make 5 litres. So we're going to create a 5 litre continuous brew. So you take that 500 mils, you keep that aside. The other 500 mils, you consume. Then you brew up another batch of tea, same ratios. So you got, but you've got to scale it up to five litres, or four, four and a half, actually. So four and a half. So you're going to have 400 mils of sweet, four and a half litres of sweet tea and the 500 mils that you've already made. You put that all in, you leave that for another seven days. So now you've got five litres. So I've just shown you how to scale up. You've got five litres. So once that five litres is ready, you brew up some tea and you store sweet tea, same ratios, you store that in the fridge. Now whatever you spigot out, you put exactly the same amount of sweet tea back in. And so what that does is you are continuously producing kombucha every single day. Mm. So just there's a little bit of work up front, but once the continuous brew is set up, you have this five liters on tap, continuously. And what happens with the scobies? They just keep growing and you just take them out? Yes. So the scobies, or, or yeah, eat it, smoothies, yeah. chop it up, dehydrate it, pet treats, kids' treats. Pet treats, pets like it. Pets, pets like it, Cat dry it. it. Yeah, people use it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it's no good stuff. <laughs> There's not much probiotics in there. I mean, when you, oh. the scoby itself yeah. is really bits of sugar. You might get lucky and get Saccharomyces buati, but I personally, I don't think it's that substantial in terms of a probiotic. Right. Is there a limit to how much you can have a day? Like, is there too, can you have too much of it? This one I'm not so particular on because it's not so dense in terms of its probiotic content. It's mainly your organic acids that are in there, your acetate. Again, monitor. You, know, you might get some, some sort of die-off it's not going to be as, I guess, of a risk than, say, your kefirs, yeah. but start slowly, introduce it. So what's the maximum amount of kefirs you could have a day, that you should have a day? I think, well, start 
250 is a good point to start. But when myself, I've been having it for so many years, I can have a lot. Because my gut, I, can, I will have it for breakfast. I'll have 250 mils for breakfast. I'll have another 250 mils before dinner. I'll have kefir cheese. I'll have sauerkraut. I'll have kombuchas. I have lots of fermented foods. You can't my have too much as long as your stomach can yes. it doesn't upset you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and assuming you, you don't have a sensitivity to a histamine or something like that. Mm. Fermented foods do create histamine. And someone that has a sensitivity to histamine should be mindful of having too much fermented foods. So a naturopath will tell you probably avoid it if you have histamine intolerances. Mm -hmm. And what flavouring can you put dried fruits again or can you put slice up some ginger and put fresh ginger straight in and fresh turmeric straight in? Yeah. You can. Oh, totally. I mean, on your second ferment, it's really flexible in what you can add. Yeah. The first ferment, you don't want to interrupt it with any enzymatic activities from fresh. Whereas the second ferment, fresh ginger, fresh turmeric, mm -hmm. fresh herbs, mint, basil, fresh strawberries, strawberries, yeah. strawberries yeah. blueberries. Yeah. Berries are awesome. I didn't mention it in the gut health section, but what my research is showing is that berries or high antioxidant foods like green tea are hugely beneficial to boosting the good type of bacteria in the gut. So I highly encourage you to have lots of these type of foods and even turmeric, spices. What's the difference between the and the kombucha? So the, the cousins, yeah. one's made with green tea and honey, yeah. the other's black tea and sugar. That's really... But on the kind of benefits... The benefits, very, very similar. I would rate Juna a little bit higher because it's got the inulin from the honey and the antioxidants from the green tea. So slightly better. Okay. So I'll wrap that part. Is there any other questions before I move on? How many tea bags or tea leaves, grams, did you use to... That is a very good question. I didn't answer that when I presented. So it's two tea bags per litre. Yes. Organic tea bags, preferably, no bleaching, no chemicals. We have some good tea bags downstairs if you're interested, organic, clean. Mm. Same, same. The only thing is, I reckon if you're going to use different types of teas from conventional, have a spare. So if you've got a spare, if the batch fails, and kombucha, you'll know, if kombucha fails, it's because it's not fermenting fast enough. It's not producing enough acid. So it's susceptible to mold. So if you, any, if you see anything green and furry on the top. Just be warm or kept to certain temperature? Not particularly. I mean, all, ferment, all our ferments, they kind of thrive between, say, 18 to, say, 24 degrees, mm -hmm. which is your nice ambient temperature. But, I mean, some days are going to be hotter, some days are going to be cooler. So fine, in winter, at this point, just a nice warm cupboard is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Two tea bags per litre. Mm. Litre of tea. If you were making the chun kombucha, how much honey would you put in? Yep, it's about, for memory, it's about a third of a cup. 227 grams? 227 grams. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we'll wrap, we'll wrap the kombucha <coughs> and we'll move on to now your fermented vegetables. Dark spot, 48 hours. Dark warm spot. Why don't you put kombucha in the fridge you said earlier? What, what not, the, not the fermenting part, not when you're actually trying to oh, store yes. the scoby. Because what happens is the bacteria get really sluggish. And then when you try and ferment it, when you take it out to ferment again, the ferment is stymied, so you're not acidifying fast enough and susceptible to mould. So could that cause why you can't, like I've noticed sometimes I don't get as much fizz on some batches than others? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. And also when you do the second ferment, make sure, because yeast cells are 100 times bigger, make it clear, the, I know cold valves very well, and they actually did a lot of work in Canada with the scientific institute there to actually extract the good bacteria from vegetables itself. Hence why I trust this product. This is one of the only few starters I use that's kind of artificially produced. So why is it a starter in what respect? 
starter. Cultures, yeah. It's got cultures in it. So it's got a lot of Lactobacillus plantarum, which is the good type of bacteria, because I'll touch on it in a sec. But what we want is in any ferment to really drop the pH of the product fast. Is people clear what pH is? I'll explain it a little bit. So pH is a measure of acidity. So it's how much acid is in the product. So the lower the pH, the more acid that's in the product. So with food safety, what you're trying to do is rapidly drop that liquid or this vegetable to around, say, less than four. So for food safety, really below 4.6 is pretty good. Four is like you're getting bulletproof territory when not, no pathogen, no bad bacteria can grow. So all I'm doing is I'm just activating the starter. It takes a bit, about 10 minutes. So I've got about a gram of starter to about a kilo of cabbage that I'm making. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of information around about alkalizing diets for benefits of that. Yep. Do these acidic type foods and drinks alkalize in the system or do they remain acidic? It's, it's all relative when you're talking acidity. When you're talking like the stomach pH, you're talking something like two. Mm -hmm. So it's all relative to, well, if something is above two, it's alkaline. So all these products will be alkaline because nothing is as acidic as stomach acid, hydrochloric acid. So I wouldn't get too caught up with that. As long as you're eating really clean and pure, taking all the chemicals out, having an understanding of the type of bacteria in your gut. Because what we're, we're finding is, well, butyrate is an acid. So it's actually dropping the pH of that gastrointestinal environment to digest the foods properly. So that's the main thing. So that's my recommendation. So fermenting vegetables, very, very, very old craft. I'm talking thousands of years old. And all our ancient cultures, in some way, shape, or form, have been fermenting, even Australians. So Captain Cook, when he first came, had lots and lots of sauerkraut on board his ships to make sure that they weren't dying from scurvy, so they could make this sauerkraut is so rich in vitamin C, so making sure that they're not going to die from scurvy. The Chinese sailors were doing it in the 14th and 15th century as well. So really, really long history of fermenting. The Europeans, you know, with sauerkraut, the Koreans with kimchi. The Japanese have lots of ferment, fermented miso type products, koji type ferments. So really rich part of our culture. Very, very important for storing vegetables and crops in kind of seasons where they could get plenty of it to help for, you know, when things were not so good. So uh, like a storage mechanism, a form of food preservation. So what's actually happening in the fermentation? So what we're doing is we are taking, for instance, a cabbage, which is quite, quite a sugary type of vegetable, and we're putting lactobacilli, and what's the lactobacilli doing is it's converting, naturally converting, all those carbohydrates, the sugars into lactic acid and rapidly preserving the product by dropping its pH. Does that make sense? What's the benefits of fermented vegetables? Well, I've got alkalizing up there because relative to the gut, pH, it is alkalizing. It's detoxifying. It's going to get rid of a lot of the bad type bacteria like E. coli in the gut. Rich in prebiotics, rich in probiotics. I love that because Kefir has got lots and lots of you know, like bacteria in there. Like sauerkraut, which is equally as powerful, it's what we call a symbiotic, because it's got both pro and pre together. So you're having the good bacteria, roughly around 15 strains of good bacteria, plus you have this fiber from the actual vegetable. So whatever you're fermenting is gonna be some form of fiber, which is great. Rich in vitamins, enzymes, and it makes things easier to digest. Vegetable fibers are typically pretty hard to digest, so that's why it gets into the gut. and It actually pre-digests, it makes it easier to digest, as well as providing food for the good bacteria. Does that make sense? And how do we make it?
So all we've done is we have taken roughly around a kilo of cabbage and we've let this sit for about an hour with a tablespoon and a half of Himalayan salt, which is around 2%. So about, around 20 grams of Himalayan salt. Just the pink? Pink, yep, the pink Himalayan salt. And what happens within that process of an hour? is the moisture starts to get extracted from the cabbage. So what you'll see is all the water starting to come out. And what's also happening is we're setting the pectins in the actual cabbage so we get this nice, firm, crunchy sauerkraut. So we don't want mushy sauerkraut. Mushy sauerkraut is not nice. <laughs> For me personally, some might like it. But I want to set those pectins. And what this should taste like is a little bit like seawater. That's what we want. And the important thing to realize is that, try that what we want to we do is make sure we don't put too much salt because if the salt is too much, we can't get it out. But we don't want to undersalt it where we compromise the safety of the product. So it's essentially seawater. Think seawater. How's that tasting? Do you like seawater? Mm -hmm. So do you say one tablespoon? One and a half tablespoons. Yeah. If you're using a scale, 20 grams. <laughs> Just cabbage and salt. <laughs> Very simple. Does the salt leach the nutrient out of the cabbage into that water? It will, through osmotic pressure, release some of the nutrients, but we're going to be putting all in the fermentation. So whatever comes out is going to be used directly inside the fermentation. So that gives you an indication of what your product should be tasting like. So when you're fermenting at home, that's a good kind of signpost. This is where I should be. Think seawater. Now I'm going to get a brave soul to come up and help me pack this. It's a great experience as well because you're doing it. Anybody brave? Yep. Come on. Come on up. So what we've done with the equipment is, there's a couple of gloves there, you can grab that. So what we've done with the equipment is I've just, I've literally just hand washed that. But the, the important thing to realize is that with fermenting vegetables, it's not so forgiving as making these products like, sour, like um, kefir and kombucha. The reason being is this is a lot more susceptible to mold type fermentations if we don't get this right. So a couple of insurance policies because it's a long ferment. I'm talking a sauerkraut could take you four weeks. Using a starter culture like Caldwell's will be ready in 10 days, but also rapidly drops the pH to suppress mold. So I'll set you up in this corner here. Let me just get you to stand here. I'll move that across for you. So that's the benefit of using a starter culture. But the other thing to note is that the, the equipment sanitation becomes more critical as well. Because mold spores will normally be on the actual vegetables. So I'll start you pounding first. Just yep, just... <laughs> For how long? a couple of minutes. I'll, I'll tell you when it's ready. <laughs> I'll keep talking. <laughs> so in terms of... So what we're doing now is we're pounding that kraut to get break those cell walls and get a bit more moisture out of it. Just to create a bit more texture in the product, get more moisture, help the fermentation along, extract more sugars. And then, with this stuff here, so what I recommend, if you're an experienced fermenter, is anybody making sauerkraut at the moment? Sauerkraut? So someone that's a bit experienced in the there. You made one. <laughs> 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 Next. 
So if you're making it and you're comfortable with it, you're not getting mold spoilage, you got, you got it down pat. Then just washing the products in hot water with soap is perfectly fine. If you're a newbie that's just starting out and you're excited about gut health and you want to fix your gut and get healthy and all that, what I recommend is actually using something like a peroxide. Is anybody familiar with 3% peroxide using it? No. It is very inert, this product, because it literally you mix it up with water and it reduces to pretty much water and oxygen. So it's very, very inert. But remember I told you about the lactobacilli producing peroxide to kill candida? That's peroxide. So lactobacilli produce peroxide. So what that does is it gives you a bit more of a, I guess, a safety net that you're not going to have any mold spores in the, in the actual equipment. Does that make sense? Yep. I don't sanitize, but it's purely up to you guys. If you're starting out for the mm -hmm. first time, I highly recommend using a sanitizer and the starter culture. If you're not using a starter culture, what's happening is the lactobacilli on the actual cabbage, we use an organic cabbage, and so we know there's no chemicals in there, we very lightly wash the cabbage. And so we, we want to try and keep all those, because it's organic as well, so it's clean. We want to keep a little bit of that bacteria on the actual cabbage, because that bacteria, if you're doing a, like a wild ferment, is what's going to move that fermentation forward. If you're starting out, use a starter culture. <laughs> It's far more safer, because this can be a safety risk if you don't do it properly. And it's faster and more consistent, so the flavor is a lot more consistent. I know Gary, so I trust him. Any questions? Is there extra um, like bacteria in the sachet? Yes. You normally get that's what you're saying, right? I'll pass it along. So you'll see the actual strains, and all those strains are what they've extracted naturally from vegetables. Mm -hmm. So it's your natural, vet, but you, all you're doing is you're just putting a huge load of it mm. to just drop that pH fast. Because you could have different bacteria from different vegetables. Yes. So they're just saying, oh, you can do cabbage, but you'll get different yeah, from all different vegetables. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. Well, the main ones for fermented vegetables are going to be a lactobacillus group, yep. primarily plantarum. That's the main one. So there's bucket loads of that in there. It's just an insurance policy, pretty much. No one wants mold. It's not a nice thing. You wait for four weeks, and you're like, oh, you're looking at the cut, is it ready yet? And then you get this <laughs> green layer on top and you just invested all that time and effort. It's not nice. Is it really obvious that it's got mold? Mm. That's a good point. Mold will be green and furry. If you see like this white layer, it's most likely yeast, cam yeast. So look for green and furry. If it's not green and furry on any of this, kombucha can go green and furry if you don't do it properly. Normally if you're not adding enough of the starter culture at the start, the kombucha starter. You, the balance is not quite right. Say for instance you get, you take a, like one of our packets and then try and do a five litre brew straight away. There's not enough. It has to be 100 mils per litre. So that ratio is extremely important. 99% of spoilage is caused by that. Same with this one. This one is if you don't have like a, a proper airlock, because mold need oxygen to thrive. So that headspace when we fill this has got oxygen. So what we're going to do is we're going to put an airlock on it. So all the gas can come out and all the oxygen stays out. So that's what we're trying to do. So I think you're good. Yeah. It's a good pounding, yeah. nice. So what you want to do now is you want to just, just you can use your hands yeah. and you can just, well, one second. What we'll do is we'll just put the starter. So, so the starter is just, you follow the instructions on the packet. I've put a gram in here to 100 mils of water. That's not the peroxide, that's, no, that's the starter. Starter, I'm not going to peroxide. No, 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 it's pounding. <laughs> yeah. Just give it a bit of a mix. Yeah. All we're doing is you're just dispersing it through. That's all. Yep, that's it. And then just put it in. So I just want to make sure I disperse all that lactic acid bacteria through it. 
But, yep, we can pack. So you can use a combination. Right to the top. So put a handful in full first, sorry, and then use this packer and stomp it. Okay. Yep, so one handful and then stomping. So what we're doing there with that stomping process is we are stopping those little gaps in pockets forming. So those pockets can hold air. So by pounding it, we're closing all those little air spaces within the product. Does that make sense? I'm dropping cabbage in there. That's okay. We'll clean up later. It's all good. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. What about the store-bought, like I've seen store-bought unlike options for fermented vegetables, do you rate those? Yeah, look, I, in terms of the store-bought stuff, they're pretty good. I mean, some of them, I don't think any of them use call bells, but they'll use a different type of starter. So ask the, ask the supplier, the, the, like what, what are you actually using as a starter? Are you wild? Are you using wild fermentation? I trust Colwell, so I'll rate them. I don't think any manufacturer that I know of uses Colwells. Mm -hmm. Others would be buying it from us. <laughs> yeah. So they're not, there's so no... What would you be looking for if you were buying? So you sell them, do you? The so starter cultures? Factories. No, no, like you sell them products? We, we don't at this point, but in future we'll look at it. We're looking at it. So at the moment we're just kits and items or, and education to actually teach people how to ferment. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to ferment. Some people want to, you know, they want the convenience of buying a good product. Yeah. We're going to make that option available probably in the next couple of months where we can, you can buy our, our sauerkraut or our whatever we make and it'll be proper because I'm very strict. So with the starter, um, can you keep growing it for your next ferments? The same as you, you know, to keep it a bit? <laughs> Someone, every time they ask that question, it's a process called backslopping. And it's not ideal. Oh, so back what yeah. Idea. You, what you can use, is you can actually use this way. Oh, the way. Yeah. yeah. The way produces a slightly different taste. Right. It's not so clean. I don't particularly like that taste, mm -hmm. but it's perfectly fine because it's so rich in lactic acid bacteria. But I don't recommend back slopping because it shifts. The bacterial species shift. So you don't exactly know batch to batch what's going to be in there. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, that's really full. Nice one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put this, what we call a pickle pebble. <coughs> so all this is is just to... Inside? So what we'll do firstly, I think we want to maybe a little bit too much on this. Don't take some out? Yeah, take a little bit. Oh, I wasn't watching. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> I have a problem. Yep, that's good. That's, good. that's good. That's good. And just use the packer and push it so we get all that moisture up. We want that because mm -hmm. that moisture is going to actually insulate. is going to insulate and, and close that headspace and mean there's less oxygen, less chance for spoilage. And what you're going to do is just make sure there's no pieces because we don't want any pieces in the headspace because if there is a mold spore hanging on one of those pieces of vegetables, it's sitting in the headspace. So we want to make sure we push down all those vegetables. And then what we're going to do is, can you guys see there? You see oh, okay? Yeah, you're good? Cool. And then we'll put that weight on. Doesn't matter which way. Doesn't matter which way. Put the weight down and then just push it a little bit. That's yeah. it. That's good. And so the weight is holding everything down. So what happens is as things ferment, that liquid's going to change a little bit. And that makes things float. The density of the liquid changes during the ferment. And things that are lighter are going to float. And if that's sticking in the headspace, that's how you get your mold. So this is pushing everything down. And then what we want to do is the ball mason jars, which we have downstairs, regularly come with this, this metal lid. The problem with these lids is they're rust. Because with salt, it's very susceptible to rust. So mason tops have a plastic version. It's BPA free. That's perfectly fine. And obviously, sorry. And obviously the pickle pipe. That's good. Yep. Just close it down. Yep. So you just put the lid on top. Do I have to also make sure there's nothing left? Yes, you pull it into the skunk and the cabbage out of it. Yep, so make sure it's all set properly. That's good. Yep. So you just put the pickle pipe in there and then we're just going to seal that. Mm -hmm. 
a baby. <laughs> a little dummy thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's it. That's it. Round of applause. Yeah. Great demonstrating. Wow. Great stuff. So we've got some sauerkraut coming around. That's the sauerkraut we made from the last workshop. So it's been about a month. <coughs> so you get to taste exactly what it's going to taste like. And this is going to be ready in about four weeks. No, sorry, ten days. Yeah. Four, it'll be four weeks if you don't use a starter. Can you use purple cabbage? Absolutely. You can use purple cabbage. You can use... In the Mason Tops kits here, that has everything you need to get started. That has an awesome recipe book where you can ferment pickles, you know, cucumber pickles, garden vegetables. There's all sorts of options. If you do ferment cucumbers or very watery vegetables, increase your salt, take note of this, to 3.5%. So if it's like a cucumber that has a lot of water in the product, it's going to release a lot of water and drop that salt concentration. So you're going to boost that up to about three and a half. How many? Three and a half. So it'll be 35 grams in a batch of one kilo. Yeah. So lots of veg lots of vegetable recipes, ferment vegetable recipes is a book inside of here. The Kefir Co. Kefir makers also have recipe books. The cheese maker has recipe books. So it's all there. Lots of different options to try. So is there, we're just about to finish up, but is there any questions? Any? Yep. Um, my question is about the milk kefir, because I probably managed to kill two of them by surprise. Right. The first time, because I had to go somewhere urgently, by the time I came back, it was like, yeah, don't even try it, throw it away. Mm -hmm. The second time, I actually don't know what to do after the first one or two days. Do I strain? it into something that I they keep in the fridge and then reuse. What is the process? Yeah, so what you do is when you ferment for that day or two, you're making milk kefir. The first day, what you want to do is when you think it's ready, taste it and see, well, it's too sour. Is it nice? If it's ready to your palate, you strain it. So you, you want to take the grains out of it to stop that ferment. And then you get that grain into fresh milk. How do you strain it? So you can use a strainer, you can just use a kitchen strainer, or you can use a kefir co, which has the strainer actually built into the lid. So again, because making kefir is such a time-consuming process, using something like this with the strainer in there yep. is going to be very easy. So Am I straining through the narrow ones or through the... So milk is this one, right. and water is that one, okay. because the milk grains are smaller. So when I strain, what is it I'm straining? So what you're doing is you're straining like a yogurt. You know that stuff that you tasted? Yep. The, the milky That's one? one that goes up. Yep. So you're rushing to work in the morning. You just want a quick probiotic kit. Just pour it. But if the batch is ready, then you can strain the whole lot into a jar, a, a mason jar. or yeah. You put that in the fridge. In the fridge. What's kept on the strain? So what will be left in the bottom is just the grains. Right. And then I can pour more milk. Milk to that line. Continue again. Now, day number three. Yes. I have a second batch that I have prepared. Do I pour it back into the original jar that's in the fridge? Perfectly fine. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. Oh, uh, yep. That's right. on, on that same thought, when you've got too much grains of bread, you can freeze or whatever. Yes. How do you actually do that? Yes. So I don't recommend freezing water grains because it damages specifically some strains in there. Hilgardi, which is Lactobacillus Hilgardi, is very susceptible to freezing. So you will kill your grains by freezing it. Milk kefir, you can freeze, but what you do is you add a cryoprotective agent in there, something like a milk powder or a colostrum powder or some, something milky. Just the regular milk powder is perfectly fine. And what you're going to do is you're just going to dust that grain, a tablespoon of milk powder, Put it into a freezer bag, zip lock it, and in the freezer. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? How do you know when there's too many grains in there? When yes. there's enough to divide it up to take some out? Excellent question. So what you want to do is you'll start off with, say, 5 grams of milk or 15 grams of water. Wait till you have four times as much. So when 5 goes to 20, then you'll start taking some out. Mm. And the same thing with the water one. And then you can gift it, you can, you can eat it. It's your choice. 
they're very, very good for you mm -hmm. to use. Or if you can afford another yeah. barrel or clean tube as well. So you can yeah. Or you just double the batch. Mm. Just make a bigger batch. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and the good thing about these, these cheese makers here, which we're getting in next week, you, these lids are interchangeable. So what you could do is you can make a, this is a 1.4 litre batch. So if you have lots of milk grains and you're not making cheese, just swap the lid and make a big batch. That's the option. With um, the fermenting vegetables, do you need to burp the jar after a few days or can it just stay on or can you buy those ones that have got that thing on the top? That Great question. This product here is burp free. You can literally, once this, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave this here <laughs> for the next four months and it's going to be ready. You just, there's no burping involved because this has a valve in it. You see this little thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. So what happens is the valve is so small. You see that little, mm -hmm. little yeah, it's valve there? So it's self burping. So when you use the big airlocks, they have the water that you have to put the water in or the moat systems that you have to put water and monitor it. This is a set and forget system. If you followed all those steps that I told you, you literally leave it in a cupboard somewhere and come back 10 days later and it's done. You can forget about, I've forgotten for men's and come back a month later, two months, I've got miso going. Can I leave it for a year? Yeah, I mean, in, in Korea they have kimchi that's 20 years old. So. Mm. I mean, it's a culinary thing. I mean, it's not a food safety issue. All that happens is over time, it develops some unique flavor traits. It's like a cheese. You can age cheese. It's the same thing. You can age this. You can let this grow for a year and come back and taste it. And it's going to be perfectly safe, but the flavor is going to be very different. Yeah. So as long as there's no mold, it's going to be safe to eat? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fermented fast enough. The mold is like a little warning sign. If you see mold, you know, well, this ferment hasn't progressed fast enough. There's something wrong with it. We need to turf it. Never try and recover a moldy kombucha because the mold, you see the mold on the top. The mycelia are spread right through the product. It's like little tendrils. You, you don't want to go there. Really not. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because that's how I was fermenting my cabbage. Yep. I was taught that because my grandmother and her mother and mm -hmm. yeah. Well that's still considered okay to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, absolutely. That's no mold of <coughs> It's fine. Yeah. Oh, totally. That was ready within like probably a week. Because um it was warm, quite warm in their house as well, the yes. temperature. So yes. that also varies if it's too cold or yes. um so does is that still okay? Perfectly fine. Okay. That's you really your traditional Kind of wild fermentation. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, it's really wild. Yeah, it's wild, which is great. But it works. But and I don't it know works. It's the same process as that. Same. Oh, it's the same. Identical. I mean, ideally, what I want people to get to is be so good at what they're doing in terms of fermentation where they don't need a starter culture. Because uh -huh. ultimately, that's where you want to get to. For a beginner starting out, the starter culture is good because I don't want you to get disheartened. Yeah, yeah getting a mole fermentation, oh, I put four weeks in, of effort into this and now, mm. and then people don't stick to it because I want to really, for you guys to stick to this process so your life can be transformed, you know, like this is good stuff. I really believe in these products and it's so much fun to make. Yep. Um, I've got like a two part question. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier the lady who had that very low read yes. for her gut microbiome. Um, is it possible if your gut is at that level to bring it right back? And how long would it take like through a process of what? Like, is it just these sorts of foods and drinks or is it more than that? Yes, uh, look, absolutely. I mean, if you, I mean, at her level, because of the chemo and the antibiotic use, some strains we might not be able to get back. Getting what we call BDL, which is below detectable levels, it's not to say that it's not there. And then using the right types of foods and dietary intervention, lifestyle changes, we can shift the bacteria. We, we actually can. The science is still very early, but the key things seem to be your fermented foods, a good quality probiotic, lifestyle changes, bucket loads of vegetables, lots of fiber, fi or prebiotic supplements. 
that's where we're going to be able to shift your gut bacteria the most substantial. And if you're low FODMAP or if you've got any form of bloating, because if, if I tell you increase your fiber now to 25 grams or you know, 30 grams, 99% of you not, guys are going to come back to me, I'm bloated. <laughs> I'm, I'm, or I've got some sort of gastrointestinal discomfort or abdominal issues because you're not used to that level of fiber. That's where something like an acacia fiber is very gentle, can shift the lactobacillus and the bifidobacteria, your two peacekeeping bacteria, mm -hmm. without causing the discomfort. So that's what you, if you want to start straight away to shift the biome, acacia fiber, mm -hmm. and then gradually increase your fiber intake. And think, and think of vegetables as the king of the dish. Small amounts of meat, good fats, truckloads of vegetables, fiber-rich vegetables. Question. Yep. Oh, do you sell acacia fibers now? Yes. Yeah. Well, pretty much everything I've shown you is available downstairs. Yeah. And you mentioned stool samples. I know you're like a food type outlet, but like, do you, is there somewhere to go through like online? Yeah. Or? No, we have a separate company okay. where we do stool analysis. Okay. So it's called, if you guys are interested, it's called Allele Microbiome. The website is gutexplorer.com.au. So we've tested now more than 200 people. We have a huge data set. I can pretty much look at a stool result and say, yep, dysbiosis. This is, this is some ways we can fix it. So gutexplorer.com.au. Make sure to follow our social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram. The Gut Health Gurus is an amazing free Facebook group full of resources, 7,000 people, lots of experienced fermenters, most of them which have been with me for the last, you know, seven years or so, probably less actually, five years, who have most of them actually been in this room with me. Like I used to run seminars with 80 people, and a lot of these people in the group started with me years and years ago. They've become experts themselves now, yeah. and th they know more about certain things than even me. So <laughs> hopefully you guys can get to that level too. Yeah, so connect with us. So before you leave, I'm sorry I went a little bit over time. So if you're going to connect with us, take a snap of this, this page here. Make sure to follow our social media. If you're interested in products, everything that I've demonstrated is downstairs with my mum. So she's got a table set up. Go see her and get started, guys. And I'm always here to help you. You know, I'm always here. You can Facebook message me, Instagram message. I'll hold your hand through this whole process. So hopefully this is not the end. Where do we get your book? My book? If I had time to write a book, <laughs> it's, I'm finding it hard at the moment. So thanks, guys. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I'll be in the corner if you have any additional questions. I don't want to keep you guys, because I know you might have appointments. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. See you later. I'll be in the corner.